Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I know there are a number of things that may have kept you away, uh, so great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Ben Bland. I'm the director of the Southeast Asia program at the Lowy Institute, and I also work on Hong Kong, which is what we're going to be talking about today. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Pleased today, really pleased to be joined by Ted Hoi, a democracy activist and, I guess, against your choice, former uh, legislative councillor from Hong Kong. Um, after studying law, uh, Ted actually didn't go into the law, unlike many politicians in Hong Kong and elsewhere. He went straight into politics, uh, working as a researcher, then a local councillor, and ultimately a member of Hong Kong's partially democratic legislative council uh, for the Democratic Party in Hong Kong. Uh, Ted is and was and has been a committed and vocal defender of human rights, not just in the legislature, but on the streets of Hong Kong. Uh, I think being pepper sprayed at least twice, or more than that, <laughs> many times at close range uh, by the Hong Kong police while trying to act as a kind of middleman to diffuse some of the tension we saw on the streets of Hong Kong in 2019 and 2020, uh, unfortunately failing to diffuse those tensions. And Ted, I guess, sadly uh, fled Hong Kong uh, last year, facing multiple, uh, some clearly politically motivated prosecutions. We can talk about that in a minute to initially seek sanctuary in Europe and the UK, but then decided in March to move to Australia to extend, I guess, a kind of a new um, position, trying to advocate for Hong Kong and Hong Kongers in Australia. Today, we're gonna to be discussing Beijing's intensifying crackdown on Hong Kong, which intensifies depressingly by the day, um, and discussing where the city's democracy movement goes from here. But before we get into that, I want to ask a bit about your story, Ted. Mm. Um, why did you decide to leave your, your home? Um, that's a really long story. Mm. Anyway, thanks for inviting me, and I'm honored to be here to talk to you. Um, the reason that I had to leave Hong Kong is that Hong Kong has totally changed. Hong Kong is not, no longer Hong Kong, not like the Hong Kong we knew before, after the 2019 freedom movement and after the introduction of the national security law. Um, because uh, in Hong Kong, we used to have freedoms, even if it's not a democracy. I would say a high degree of freedoms. And we could chant slogans, we could uh, take it to the street, street demonstrations, assemblies. But in, after 2019, after the, uh, the national security law, uh, it, they became impossible. And people like me, and on the opposition camp of freedom side of uh, Hong Kong, or for the Hong Kong's politics, and all the dissents uh, were, are now not tolerated at all. So uh, parliamentarians uh, are thrown to jails because of the, the things they've said in chamber, in parliament, because they, people like me participated in street demonstrations, standing with uh, young protesters, and they put charges against us, criminal charges, national security charges. So I, I knew that if I stayed in Hong Kong, I would face decades of jail time and perhaps life imprisonment. And to me and to many in Hong Kong, I would say, I dare say, jail time is not scary. It's not the most frightening. But uh, what's scary is that losing our freedoms and then no one can speak up for Hong Kong anymore in the future, so Hong Kong's voices cannot be heard. Because when even uh, journalists are expelled, for uh, expat uh, journalists, and uh, local media are controlled, then we will become just a like, normal Chinese city, um, to the, to more, or more to the extreme, to like North Korea, without the world hearing us. So I feel that it's the need of leaving Hong Kong, even though it's, fa it's a painful decision, I, I left with a very heavy heart, but I, fe I, I felt responsible, and I still feel responsible of doing so for Hong Kong. And I mean, how many charges or cases were you facing at that time when you left? At the time when I left, I was facing nine criminal charges. For example, uh, uh, per perverting the, co uh, the course of justice for my participation in, uh, in the streets. They accused me for covering up uh, the 
the crimes that the protesters done by uh, standing in front of them. And also, by, there are charges against me uh, for contempt of legislature, which is very ridiculous uh, as a legislator myself. And what I uh, said about what the, the things that I said and the act of protest, they were just like holding up signs at my seat in the, in the, in the chamber and not obeying uh, the, the president, the probation legislator's order and resisting security guards of the, of the uh, legislature. It's very ridiculous ones. Uh, nine charges, uh, so I was on bail. So, and I left Hong Kong uh, because I received invitations uh, by uh, Danish parliamentarians who invited me for international meetings. So, and at that point, your passport, you had actually had to surrender it to the, to the court or to the police, is that right? So you, you almost needed to organize the event in Denmark as a way to leave. Without that, you would basically be in, sitting in prison now in Hong Kong. Basically, everyone uh, facing criminal charges uh, would have their passport confiscated. And so, yes, I, my passport once was confiscated by the court, but then uh, I, I did have a track record of uh, flying around the globe and talk about climate change. And so at that time, my Danish parliamentarian friends invited me to, to their country to, uh, to uh, join international meeting. And that's why at that time, uh, the court and the police were convinced that, oh, it's only uh, your regular uh, routine, so they, they let me go. And that's why they granted me back my passport. So maybe I was just lucky. <laughs> yeah, and I think after that, the Hong Kong authorities have said both that they want to pursue you here and wherever, and also even talked about trying to prosecute those Danish parliamentarians for kind of colluding to damage national security or something along those lines. Yes, and uh, my Danish friends who invited me actually told me it happened that the, the Chinese regime, the Hong Kong regime, actually uh, made a formal request to the uh, Danish uh, enforcement, uh, to the police, uh, requesting that their parliamentarians who invited me uh, should be prosecuted and should be extradited. And it is so disrespectful and no one can imagine that it's happening. It's a uh, wolf warriors kind of diplomacy and it's, it's not just yourself but you know I was a journalist in Hong Kong and an author from 2015 to 2019 I interviewed pretty much every pro-democracy member of the Legislative Council and many other activists fighting for, for democracy or their rights in Hong Kong and pretty much all those people with any prominence who I knew then are now either in jail or in exile with almost no exceptions mm -hmm. uh, which is just yeah it's remarkable how quickly and how kind of deep uh, the cuts to Hong Kong's autonomy and, and rights have been. Um, but for you, at a personal level, like how hard was it to leave your home? I mean, I guess you're not just leaving mm. kind of the fight behind for, for democracy explicitly, but like your family, your friends, your way of life. I mean, how difficult is that? It's very, very difficult. And I grew up in Hong Kong all my life, even though I spent three years of study in Canada. And that's the only time I left Hong Kong. And then I returned. And I've been uh, fighting so very hard with my comrades, with my party colleagues, with other activists in Hong Kong. Um, I can't remember how many times we marched together in the streets of Hong Kong for democracy and freedom. And we, we did it like uh, five, six times a year. So, and I can't, I can't also uh, recall how many times we, we fought in the chamber of the parliament uh, with speeches and with all the phys physical struggles and with all the young people in Hong Kong in 2019. So they really are my, my comrades. And it's very de depressing to see uh, them uh, being thrown to jail, detained, and the assets frozen. It's on a literally everyday basis. So I read the news every day, it's, um, it, it's painful. And it's not like uh, very distant. Uh, it's not like they, uh, for my, Hong, many Hong Kongers, they are the representatives of the people, but they are my friends. I, I know their families, I know their kids. Yeah, their kids play with my kids. So uh, it's very painful. But then uh, also it's not easy for my families and especially my parents, they followed me here. 
and uh, at their age, it's harder to adapt to a new life and with language barrier and new environment, climate. So it's a totally, totally new pitch. And what's um, painful or what's heavy the most is that, uh, as I talk to quite many Hong Kongers here, they, they will talk about going back to Hong Kong and to see the families, to taste the food, and to refresh their memories of Hong Kong, even they live here. But that's the thing I can't do, and I don't know for how long uh, I will I I will be staying here. But then my memories of Hong Kong, my loved ones, my my favorite places, uh, would just fade away uh, from, um, as time goes by. It's very sad to think about that. It is. Um, it's, it's sad, and um, there's no escaping that. Mm -hmm. um, and what, and what prompted the move to Australia specifically? Because I know that at first you were in Denmark and then you went to the UK, I believe. So what made you come here, which wasn't an easy thing, given the, the rigorous border controls in place with, with COVID and everything else? Yeah, um, it's a difficult choice, actually. So I struggled and, and talked to quite many people and I also considered the, um, the international situations. Uh, yes, I spent three months in London, the UK, and then I took the time and opportunity to meet quite many uh, parliamentarians there and activists, and also my comrades there, people like Nathan Law and quite other uh, Hong Kong Hong Kongers in exile. So I, we had a lot of discussions, and I understood uh, their future plans, what their future plans are. And then I made up my mind because I understand that since they are more UK based and Europe based, and there are quite quite a few number a number of them, and I also was in contact with uh, the other comrades and other politicians in exiles in North America, and they are doing also so well, organized and already on track, and so uh, my idea was to spread Hong Kong's message uh, in different parts of the globe. And so I, so I was looking at uh, Australia and New Zealand, and uh, they are among the five eyes and important uh, strat strategically. And uh, with large uh, number of Hong Kong, Hong Kongers, a uh, large diaspora uh, community. So I, I believe that I, I was responsible to fill the gap, to be there and to get the people, Hong Kongers here organized and also uh, I believe it, it's important that strategically to, to lobby parliamentarians and government officials here because Australia is uh, an important trade partner with, with China. So there's room for me to talk more on China, China policy. And yeah, what do you think you can realistically achieve here? I know you've only been in Australia a few months thus far, but yeah, what, what do you think you can achieve? And also, what do you think Australia can and should do about what's happening in Hong Kong? It's obviously very difficult for any outside power to influence Xi Jinping's regime. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what, what do you want to achieve? And what do you think Australia can, can do? Um, I wouldn't say I want to put Australia to test. But the fact that uh, I'm allowed here is, has, an, has an implication on the Australian government on whether uh, Australia will continue to be on the freedom side. And so I'm, I, I'm grateful, of course, uh, during uh, even COVID time, I was given a visitor visa so that I can enter. And on top of that, I was given uh, exemptions to, uh, to come uh, in COVID time. And so, and an Australian government even facilitated my flight. So it's not an easy task. Um, but of course, I I would wish that the Australian government take stronger and stronger concrete actions, because I could see I can see that the Morrison government is supportive and is vocal on Hong Kong's issues, and I'm grateful for that. And. But then if you compare uh, the measures uh, being uh, taken by other countries from among the Five Eyes, if you look at the US who took the initiatives in all the sanctions individually and with all the executive orders of banning uh, chi Chinese companies 
operating uh, in, the, in the countries. And if you look at the UK of uh, giving most generous uh, BNO visas and safe havens for more, many Hong Kongers to go to, uh, uh, to flee from the terror of CCP. And if you compare them, the Australians has only given student visa, extending student visas. It's not benefiting a lot of Hong Kongers. And so I, I wish that Australia can have more concrete actions. Of course, an Australia, Australian government doesn't have the tool of sanctioning because they, they doesn't have the law. And I wish that uh, the Bank Security Act can be prioritized so that it has the, the tool to punish the wrongdoers, human rights uh, abusers, to be in line with other countries to take really concrete actions. We know that Australia's relationship with China is already in a very bad place, despite it being at least previously an important trade partner. Obviously, many trade sanctions now that Australia is facing. And I guess some people would say, look, the relationship's bad enough. Why do we need to do anything to help Hong Kong? Or I guess they would say the same about you know, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. It's not, not our problem. We're just going to make our own situation worse. There's no benefit there for the Australian people. Um, so why should why should people care about Hong Kong, and what why should Australia be willing? Why should Australia pay a price? Um, you know, potentially in terms of its relationship with China to to you know fight for for rights for people in a, a city that's ultimately quite far away, where what Australia does at the end of the day probably won't be very impactful. Yeah, that's a question that definitely needs a clear answer, and I get the questions uh, quite often, honestly here, and I. I would just put uh, very, very simple questions to not just parliamentarians and officials, but ordinary Australian citizens. Would they want Australia to be on the freedom camp, on the freedom side, on the right side of history, or be an ally or a business trading partner with CCP, with uh, authoritarian governments? Who is brutally, uh, brutally, uh, who have brutal crackdown on Hong Kong's? So, which side do Australian people want to be on? And I think it's simple. And Australian values is about freedom. It's about democracies. And I just don't think that these important universal values can be in any way compromised. Not in Australia. Not in uh, other parts of the world. So. Um, it's important to uh, make, make it clear the message is that I'm like for people like me, I'm not advocating a total boycott or disconnections, close down all the businesses with, with China. But think about uh, the, the, the degree or the line when, uh, for example, uh, if universities in Australia dare not speak up for academic freedom because they care too much about the intake of their Chinese, mainland Chinese students as their main source of incomes. That's why they'll be willing to be silent in face of persecutions by the CCP on Hong, on Hong Kong and to the Chinese. Would that be Australian value, right? If businesses, construction companies, they, they are willing to be silent because they have the constructions, opportunities, and infrastructures, and uh, Belt and Road initiatives. And would that be Australian values? I just don't think that is. So uh, I don't think Australians will be proud of their country, uh, their country if um, their country is, is submissive or can be uh, self-censoring themselves. And to, to be willing to be uh, kind of controlled economically by the superpower, I don't think Australians will be proud of their countries. So I, I wish that um, I understand that economic interests and the economy is important for people's everyday life. But uh, there are other ways to, um, to work around, to be less reliant on, on Beijing's uh, economic markets. And I believe that uh, the Australian government can be wise enough to do that. Um, I want to go back a bit you know, to Hong Kong and to what happened with the, the unprecedented protests of, of 2019 into 2020, which I guess um, sparked the, the, the huge crackdown in a sense. There's obviously been 
uh, a vicious circle in the last decade, if you like, of kind of people feeling under pressure from Beijing, uh, protest movements, and then more kind of repression coming after us, which triggers more uh, protests. Um, but what was it? I mean, you were out on the streets talking to a lot of young people and protesting as well in your, in your own way. I mean, what motivated people to be out on the streets kind of risking so much, uh, which, you know, and now they've lost a lot since then. They've, they've paid a really high price. But what was really driving that, do you think? Um, I believe that um, the young people, they felt very desperate. They, they felt that uh, it's their last chance of fighting. If they, if they lose, then it, it could be that they lose forever. They could never win again. So I, I don't agree. Of course, uh, social movements can be uh, in, in the long run, and uh, I mean a long battle. But young people are really desperate uh, about speaking up. And at, at the time they, they grew up, and it was the time that uh, Hong Kong is under um, Titan controlled, and that uh, they felt that even the system, the, the legislature and, and the court is, is controlled all by CCP, and there's no justice in this, in this society. And, and on the other hand, they, they got nothing to lose. And since they were given the opportunity anyway to be, to be in charge, to, to run the society, if even they go to vote, those representatives, people like me, can't do anything in the parliament anyway uh, for the past 24 years. Uh, it seemed to, to them that we, we couldn't achieve what they really wanted, a true, genuine democracy, one man, one vote system. So, so why not? We, and also, they've looked at, look back to the history that Hong Kongers have tried different means uh, from the very early time of the handover with joint politics. Uh, we trusted in the system, in the electoral system, and we changed policies inside parliament. We tried that with, to, to no avail. We tried peaceful demonstrations, a lot of times million people joined, and to no avail. And we tried civil disobedience uh, with uh, uh, the umbrella movement, but didn't, didn't win. So why not try harder, more physical confrontations? And they believe that's the way to go. And, uh, and I agree, and we, we have to uh, confront uh, the, the regimes. Um, I believe that democracy just doesn't uh, go to us uh, by, by mercy of CCP, so we have to fight. As, as you said, it's really hard to predict kind of the, the crests and the troughs of social movements, but I mean, do you think it's right, those young people's worst fear, in a sense that we're probably unlikely to see another big mass social movement in Hong Kong again for the foreseeable future, given that the costs of protesting, both you know, in terms of potential jail time, being beaten up by the police, other things are so high, and all the avenues for, for resistance in legislative council and elsewhere have been cut off. So do you think it, it's true in a sense that we probably won't ever see another massive social movement like that again for the, for the foreseeable future? Foreseeable future, of course, yes, maybe. We might not see something similar with uh, the 2019 protest, but then uh, the spirit is still here, and the spirit of the movement, the freedom movement, in 2019, and we ha we also we also have a slogan called "Be Water," so uh, people are water, people uh, can be powerful, water can be powerful, but we are also flexible, so we sometimes we divide. Sometimes we rejoin, and I think it's time for us to, to be water, to, to stay calm, reserve our power and energy. And I believe that uh, given time, some point in the future, uh, by, triggered by some political incidents, international situations, people definitely will rise again, as long as our spirit's still high and our hearts are still angry. We have not given up. We just need some international hands, and we just need to transform our struggles into other forms. Uh, like last two weeks, and Hong Kongers uh, were not were, were not allowed to have um, public assemblies uh, in commemorations with the June, uh, June 4 Tiananmen massacre. But then I believe that uh, hundreds of thousands of people 
held the candles in the hands and roam around in the city in, in memory of the events. And that can be totally banned by the regimes. So these powers are transformed into other forms. And that uh, would be the new face of Hong Kong's protest. And in, in terms of what's happening in Hong Kong, as, as we said at the start, the pace of the crackdown is really relentless. So just yesterday, we had hundreds of police raiding the offices of Apple Daily, leading pro-democracy, but also just entertainment newspaper in, in Hong Kong, arresting journalists and executives. And this was the first time that the new national security law had been used explicitly to target journalists for their journalistic work. Uh, not, not other aspects. We also saw the government come out and basically describe these people as criminals, although they've only been arrested. So technically, you normally call them suspects. But, but, but anyway, the, every day, basically, there's something happening like that. There's someone new being arrested or a new case. Um, what do you think, I mean, trying to put yourself in Xi Jinping's shoes, uh, if you can, um, I mean, what, what's his end game? I mean, he, he's ultimately, and the Communist Party's calling the shots, not the Hong Kong government. What do they want to see in, in Hong Kong? Do they want it to be? just like Shenzhen, uh, another mainland city, maybe more like Macau, where things look a bit different on, on the surface, but there's total control? Uh, or is it even worse than being in the mainland because it's kind of an area for the CCP of weakness and resistance? Do they have to actually have a much more tougher, securitized kind of policy that looks almost something more like what we've seen in the past in Tibet or Xinjiang? Um, if I were Xi Jinping, I would think that now my emperor is strong enough uh, economically, we are already a superpower, and most countries in the world needs to koto to me. So anyway, um, not not like in the past that I want to keep Hong Kong to maintain its freedoms, and so uh, the West would admire it, look onto it, and Xi Jinping would think that oh, we still got investment in Hong Kong, we still can earn money, we can be like Singapore and take total control. And why would I tolerate those unpleasant dissents? And that could be a danger to my power in the future. So I believe that China has grown too arrogant on that and too competent. And it would be easy for, um, for a superpower to crack down and to make everyone leave. And I don't think Xi Jinping cares anymore when, when most Hong Kongers from, from the older generation or my generation all leave Hong Kong and we, we be replaced by their own people, the mainlanders. And now I believe it's in the, in the middle of doing it. And that's the, the rationale. I think that's what, what Xi Jinping is thinking about. But it's, I mean, if we're honest, it's, it's not just about kind of replacing Hong Kongers, because part of the problem is that Hong Kong, I guess, has always been divided, right? We saw in all the different elections and polls, maybe there's 55 or 60% of Hong Kongers who, are, in some senses, are broadly pro-democracy. And then you see, you know, a significant chunk, almost half of the city is either kind of explicitly in favor of, of the Communist Party or just wants to live and work, you know, with part of the PRC in a more harmonious way. And I guess we saw that on the streets of Hong Kong and yesterday too, right? Most of those 500 police outside the Apple Daily offices and inside were Hong Kongers. Um, so what, I mean, what's kind of going through their mind in, in this divided city? I mean, what, why do you think it is that some people, you know, similar background to you, uh, similar experiences would take almost like the opposite view from you about the future of their city too? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question because I sometimes have doubts but why some Hong Kongers would turn their back on democracy and freedom and just to accept that all, all dissents can be eliminated and continue to work for and to support the regimes. I would say, they, of course, they're not the majority. The majority is very clear, clearly shown uh, in opinion polls. And of course, in the last genuine elections in 2019, at the district council local elections, uh, in which the Democrats had a landslide win. And also, I believe that's what touched, uh, touched uh, Beijing's uh, nerve, that it, sh it should be cracking down Hong Kong's totally. But then, uh, I would say for, for many, they just need to survive. They don't particularly support uh, dictatorship. And, and quite many of them even can be sympathetic to people like, like me, like us. Um, but then they need to survive. They, 
they need their lives to go on. And when all the opportunities uh, are controlled and provided by the CCP, and what can they do? And I receive that quite a lot. I'm, I'm quite uh, impartial in the, just in the middle, but I just need to continue my life. Those are the people. But then uh, the other part of the reason is that uh, quite many people can be brainwashed. And you can see after the new national security law, and the regime is changing, uh, making changes in education, uh, changing textbooks, changing history books, and to make people really believe that uh, being uh, oppositions or to be uh, dissent is unpatriotic, and which is not right, it's, which is immoral. Maybe the newer generations really believe in that, so they are, they are two limbs. And do you think that that, that will succeed? Because I guess um, in the past there were similar efforts. I mean, back we going back in the history of the protest movements. I think one of the the foundational ones of the modern era was the 2012 scholarism protests, which were against uh, this push to bring in sort of mainland or communist style patriotic ed education. So there was actually a big reaction against that. I mean, do you think people will still react against these things, or do you think you know younger generations who don't know will grow up and think differently? About, about their relationship with the People's Republic of China and the Communist Party? Well, I don't believe that the regime will succeed in really changing people's heart, but it might succeed in changing people's behavior so that there are certain topics that's defined as red lines and we shouldn't cross, and then teacher... I think we've crossed most of them already today. Yes, yes of, of course. So teachers wouldn't be speaking about it in school, and, and of course they become uh, taboo, and students wouldn't talk about it, but in, at home, their parents would talk about it, and they know exactly uh, what the truth is. So they can't brainwash everyone. Of course, it can't. And, and talking about kind of the next generation, I mean, one thing um, that I find kind of quite concerning is just the number of people who've been arrested and facing prosecution in Hong Kong. So I think more than ten thousand arrested uh, during and since the two thousand nineteen pro protests. I think more than 2,500 have been prosecuted so far. And Hong Kong only has a prison population of 7,000 people. So even if it's just hundreds of people, and I think probably hundreds probably have already been jailed already, but you're potentially looking at thousands of people adding to 7,000 people in prison. What happens to this new generation of people who are effectively political prisoners? Kind of, do they come out and become kind of new martyrs for the cause? I mean, just, I guess some of those people are struggling as we speak in prison and maybe they just give up hope altogether and back away. But, but what happens like, to the fabric of a society when you have so many people criminalized for expressing thoughts that at least half of the city shares? Uh, I believe the, re the regime doesn't care. And I've heard personally that they, they even have plans to build more prisons for, the, for political prisoners. And with uh, the introduction of the law of banning people from leaving Hong Kong, this law has already been introduced, effective uh, in the coming 1st of August. The Hong Kong itself is a big prison. People can't leave. Um, uh, the regime has complete control on who can leave, and it can ban anyone from boarding any planes or, or, or boats. So it's already a big prison. So in terms of what the young people uh, would become after jail times, it's very sad. It's not, I would say it's worse than uh, having a typical criminal record in, in other crimes because you're labeled as uh, unpatriotic and that label follows you for life in Hong Kong and you can't leave, you can't go to other countries. And so think, think about when they need to find jobs and with organizations, they will be on the black, blacklist, blacklisted. It's very miserable, so, um, so that goes nowhere. And of course, for those young people, they, they wouldn't give up. They would continue their fight. So, so it's, like, it's more like a circle that goes back to the street and they, they get arrested again and they got more and more radical. And so I don't think that it, it would be good governance at all. It, it can't achieve what, what it wanted. 
And I guess it's going to be hard practically just to govern Hong Kong if people are so unhappy. And I mean, even in, in mainland China, there's a kind of element of consent, right? That there's no obviously free and fair elections, but people to some extent have an understanding that the party is acting in their best interests, at least on some key issues, but especially on the economy. But in Hong Kong, you, you don't even have that. So, like, how do you even manage the city uh, without any, any consent? I guess it's going to be very difficult. Um, yes, it can. And um, of course, it's not uh, a good thing to do. But if you look at Singapore, right, and I don't think there's democracy at all, but uh, with the economy still running, operating, and with still investments coming, a society can run. And so I, I believe that uh, Beijing is trying to run the Singaporean model in Hong Kong, uh, giving uh, some degree of openness and some limited degree of freedoms uh, in markets, but with total elimination of dissent and complete control uh, politically and refusal uh, to progress uh, with political reform. And I, it, it might be the plan of the regimes, but still, I, I believe uh, without the democracy, without checks and balances, dictatorship always makes mistakes. And at, at, at that time, and people will rise again. Mm -hmm. And looking for comparisons in history, I guess there's an obvious one to me in a sense, which is what happened in 1989 with the activists uh, and dissidents who left China to come to Australia and the US and, and Europe uh, after the crackdown following the, the Tiananmen Square. Uh, protests and, and massacre. Um, and obviously one of the things that happened then was many of the dissidents lost their connection to their audiences back in China. They ended up spending more time, in some cases, fighting with each other <laughs> rather than fighting with the, the communist parties. How, from a kind of position in exile, how do you sustain the movement? Yeah, that's a uh, question I'm looking deep into because I, I want that to be our lesson to our generations uh, of exiled. Because um, we, we want to continue to fight on. We don't want to lose our, our influence, our power. We want to make the call so Hong Kongers can gather together and be a stronger power. But then we understand that uh, it can be difficult where, as time goes by and as we might not be able to make really concrete changes. But I think we are different uh, from uh, the 1989 generation of exiles in that it's easier for us to communicate among each other and with back to the people in Hong Kong with technologies. So I, I'm very keen on uh, keeping uh, connections and communications with what's, hap what's happening in Hong Kong and my, uh, my fellow friends in Hong Kong so that we we want them to know that uh, we are not distant from them. We are still one of them. We still feel the pain, and I share my pain with them every day. And with that communication, uh, that gives me uh, strive and motivation to, to go on. And it's easier uh, for my generation as well to survive economically. And with, it's easier to get uh, financial support from, from Hong Kong so with technologies. It's easier for us to be more transparent uh, financially so that uh, they know uh, we are still under uh, some kind of accountability. So I, I'm more confident uh, that uh, we will learn a lesson and turn a brighter page for Hong Kong as an exile. But I guess I know from talking to Nathan Law that one of the problems of this situation is that because of the national security law and the fact that you are now overseas, actually by you even just talking to your family members or friends, let alone engaging in political activity with fellow Hong Kongers back home, you could in a way be kind of endangering them because they could be accused True. of colluding with you're now, a, you're now a foreign force, a hostile foreign force, I guess, being based here. Yeah, but uh, that's very true and uh, that can be risky. So um, we take uh, precautions and with technology, but of course it can be 100% safe, but then uh, there are different ways of doing it more safe, securely. And I, I believe that it, it's the risk that we, we need to take because now in overseas, in freedoms, we can uh, say the things that we want to say, 
uh, there are times we need to make calls for Hong Kongers to do something and to, to struggle. And of course, in a safe way. Uh, but then w without, without the opportunity to make those calls, and it would be hard for them to make the call themselves. It would be uh, more dangerous for them to make the call locally. For example, uh, in upcoming uh, so-called elections in Hong Kong, the parliamentary elections, and it's now completely controlled by Beijing. And now everyone who wish to be a candidate needs to get nomination from Beijing. So it's total, Beijing totally runs the show. But then what the option left for Hong Kong is to vote informal, to vote a, uh, a blank vote. But the regime sees that. And now a, a legislation has been passed that's voting, uh, asking people and advocating for a blank vote or informal uh, can be itself a, a criminal act. So the Hong Kongers cannot make those calls and it have to be us who make the call. So still it's necessary for us to keep a connection to, to understand what Hong, Kong, Hong Kongers think and then we can say what they want to say internationally in, in a safe place. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna come to you all for questions in a sec, but I'll just have one, one more question for Ted, which is a, a difficult one, I'm afraid, <laughs> uh, to end up. Um, it's obviously very unlikely that, that Xi Jinping is going to wake up tomorrow and realize that democracy is actually a great idea for Hong Kong after yeah. all. Um, but what's, what's your best case for how Hong Kongers might secure their you know, democratic rights and their autonomy one day? How do you think, um, sort of looking out, I mm. guess, to the next 10, 20 years and maybe after that when Xi Jinping's maybe stepped down, um, how might this happen? Um, it's not too difficult for me, and I think it's more confirmed or assured to many Hong Kongers that we don't only wish to have Xi Jinping uh, changed. We don't only hope for another more open-minded leader uh, to run China. We want CCP to step down from power, and I personally believe that might be the only way to go for Hong Kongers. And I won't go as far as to talk about, uh, like for example, independence of Hong Kong. Uh, might not be uh, practical, pragmatic for Hong Kongers, at least uh, now. But then going towards the goal of having the power dissolved, or, or at, le at least I, I'm not satisfied going back to uh, what we were a half democracy after all the brutal crackdowns, after all that we have lost, we want a genuine one, what genuine democracy. And of course, we, we don't believe, I don't believe that CCP would give us that. So it's, it would be, it would take a lot of struggle, a lot of fright, a lot of confrontations until it steps down from power. And that would be the best end game. Okay, well, we have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions, so if you just stick your hands up and Andrew will come to you with a mic, and if you could just tell us your name and affiliation, um, if, if you have one, I think we've got one over here. Hi, my name's Emma Rossi. I'm a former journalist and am a friend of Human Rights Watch. Uh, my question is what your recommendation would be for those of us that have friends and loved ones who might be working in Hong Kong for an ex, you know, as an expat, and whether they should be doing something, um, and what that what should what that should be. Mm. Uh, yes, that's uh, very useful questions. Actually, there Hong Kong is still an international city, even uh, we've lost uh, almost all of our freedom. But there are quite many expats still working in Hong Kong, Australians and, and other nationals. And they are mostly uh, professionals. And I believe that it's useful um, to speak up in their professional bodies and to, uh, to monitor and to speak up for uh, the best practices and guidelines for their for their professions, because now uh, the CCP, the Hong Kong regime, is attacking uh, every profession to take away 
their rights. Uh, for example, the journalists and also the bankers and, and also all the licensing bodies, professional licensing bodies, is taking away their rights. So it's their job to defend the rights professionally and to, to be adhered to and uphold for professional guidelines. I think that itself is useful against uh, the erosion of power and avoid giving more and more power and so that professions will be um, allied or be uh, manipulating tools for the CCP. And also, it's relatively uh, safer for uh, other nationals who, who are in Hong Kong from political persecutions. Of course, there's a risk that they would uh, just catch everyone and randomly and as hostages, but still, uh, it's safer for, for expats, for Australians in Hong Kong, to speak up this on social media, and um, to be in or join civil societies uh, in Hong Kong, support them. It's relatively safer. And if uh, that can be done, that would be also best for Hong Kong's fight for freedom. Thanks, Ted. Uh, my name is Warwick Jones, and I'm the Australian Federal Police uh, Visiting Fellow here at the Lowy Institute. And over the years, I've worked with a number of Hong Kong police um, and trained with them as well. And um, they've always struck me as an organisation built on the British tradition of democratic policing. And my sense, knowing a number of them, is that there probably is a, quite a dilemma for them at the moment in terms of how they're doing their work. Um, I'd be interested to see what your thoughts are on the legitimacy of the Hong Kong police force going forward. Yes, thank you for the question. That's a very interesting one. It struck me as well. I, I couldn't believe our, our police, uh, once prestigious internationally and respected by the people, has turned into uh, something like, I, I would say, mobs and gangsters. It's almost, almost there. And I, I believe one reason is that uh, they are so used by the regimes and they can be very brainwashed uh, in their peer groups that they are really fighting uh, against uh, rioters for justice. It's really for the good for Hong Kong. They are so brainwashed. And on the other hand, uh, they are, uh, wouldn't say, would, would it be uh, the word infiltrated by uh, the CCP uh, forces so I understand that they, they are trained by uh, somehow the Liberation Army and the uh, mainland Chinese police. So they have trainings together. So they, that changed their mindsets. And I, I don't know it's, uh, what's the best way to uh, have them back, uh, to have them back like when they were before, but then, uh, for international collaborations, it's really for uh, free countries and Western countries to have a clear cut uh, with police, not to s provide any weapons, not to provide any trainings, and uh, be vocal uh, to say that oh, under, even under international standards, riot police shouldn't shoot people like that. It's not according to international safety protocols and it's uh, a clear abuse of human rights. So if uh, police organizations uh, in other countries in Australia can speak up, that will be very, very useful. And at least for, for those who really believe they are, they are doing justice to, to really strike them that they are not. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Ted, hi, thanks very much. Um, I, I lived in Hong Kong for 15 years, so I was fascinated to come along and, and hear you talk. Um, I think you all of us kind off. of, um, uh, all of us kn knew who C.Y. Leung was. You know, so pretty... you just want to tell us your name and if you... Oh, sorry, Ed Slade. Um, I'm just a Hong Kong, former Hong Kong resident. Um, most of us knew who C.Y. Leung was, you know, pretty nasty, fairly greedy guy, bad father, you know, all those things. Um, Carrie was expected to be an improvement if we look back at when she was first elected. Um, how do you think, uh, who is Carrie Lam now? And, and how does she not walk the streets in shame at what she 
produced as a leader? I mean, disastrously bad tenure. Yeah, um, that's, that's also the other part that struck me, and I couldn't believe Carrie Lam would turn into like another person. And I still remember as at the time, 2016, when I was first elected to the parliament, and we would have regular uh, closed door meetings with Carrie Lam. And she wasn't like that in, in that time, at that time. And we could have conversations. And I remember telling, telling her that uh, amongst the, the party members but, uh, in the meeting rooms, I have the less confidence and trust in the government. So uh, please uh, behave and in the future and not to let Hong Kong's freedom deteriorate. And we can have conversations like that. But I, I believe that um, in, the, in the past few years, when the attitude of Beijing changed, and Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's attitude changed, she had to change the strategy. And she might not have full control anymore on Hong Kong. It, it's not her that's running Hong Kong. So it will be Beijing running it directly and she being a puppet. And of course, I, it's hard for me to understand why people are willing to be a puppet. I, I just don't, I, I can't comprehend. But uh, that's what's happened. And now she's not uh, uh, Car Carrie Lam like she was anymore. And that, that's terrifying to see how people change because of political change. But I would say that the people won't change. The people like me will, will never change. We see what justice is, and we'll fight on forever. But it's very sad to see yeah, how uh, the other side of humanity. <laughs> yeah, I have a question here, and then I'll, I'll come. Thank you, Ted. My name's Prue Williams, and I'm a friend of Human Rights Watch. Um, <clears throat> you say the end game, ultimately, for you and your movement is for the CCP to, to dissolve in what would be a new era, I suppose. Um, what I'd like to know is, is your movement gaining any traction on the streets and ground in mainland China? And, um, and yeah, I know that's probably hard to, to know, but uh, do you have connections there? Do you, do you feel that you're gaining any traction in mainland China? Um. That's a very valid point. That I, I, that's the comment I get from time to time, that uh, Hong Kong, even uh, as an international city, but it's only 7 million people. But look at the population of China. So Xi Jinping's uh, attitude and all the crackdown on Hong Kong is to, the, its audience is not Hong Kong. It's the whole population of China. That's why it's competent it's, and it's willing to uh, give up Hong Kong's freedom. So uh, it's important to be connected with uh, the mainland Chinese to, to get them on board. But it's a very, very difficult task. And over the years, uh, with so-called one country, two system, in the past, it, it kind of worked uh, in the sense that uh, we, uh, Hong Kongers and mainlanders, have very different way of life, and we uh, the mainlanders have very limited uh, access to f uh, information flow in Hong Kong. It can watch Hong Kong's news, but when it comes to politics, and then it suddenly will just pause on their TV. So they don't know what's happening in Hong Kong. And we, um, there's border still, somehow, and from Hong Kong to mainland China. So Hong Kongers and mainlanders can be very separated uh, in reality. So. Uh, it's better when, when we are overseas, for example, in Australia. We can try to connect them, and we find support and allies in many of their groups, and they support Hong Kong. I'm grateful for that. But to influence the massive populations in Hong Kong, uh, in mainland China, it's a very, very difficult task. We are looking up at ways, uh, using technologies, perhaps, uh, uh, to penetrate that, but. Uh, it, it will take uh, a very long time. And they are so, I, I would say, brainwashed with their educations that we should, should not speak against the government. 
otherwise you're not good citizens, you're not loyal, not patriots. It's very hard to have breakthrough on that. It takes generations, but we'll try hard on that. Hi, thanks guys. My name is Michael Cox. I'm a Hong Kong permanent resident. I work for the South China Morning Post from 2011 to 2019. I now write a weekly column for the Apple Daily for now. Um, I'm interested in the global reach of the national security law and the provision that, a, that authorities claim they can charge anybody anywhere. It hasn't been enacted as yet, but I'm, I'm wondering what your thought... Obviously, you've, you've probably thought about it, as have many of us. How do you think it will be used? And maybe you could share some of your experience on how your Danish friends were have, have been affected. Yes, the national security law has an extra uh, territorial jurisdictions, and that's quite troubling for, for many, not only Hong Kongers, but also foreign nationals. And, but at least among the Hong Kong diaspora, and for many Hong Kongers overseas, you can see its effect in that, uh, for example, back two years ago or last year, and there are rallies, there were rallies here in Australia and participated by massive number of Hong Kongers. I believe the one in Sydney, we had uh, more than 3,000 people together uh, against the CCP regime in Hong Kong. But then after the national security law, and more and more people have to use face masks and hats and sunglasses and you, to hide their identities totally, because uh, even those Hong Kongers in Australia, they have assets in, and family members back in Hong Kong. They don't want them to be endangered. And when, as they go back to Hong Kong at the border, they can get very nervous. Would CCP know that I, I did protest against them? So I, I believe it's the fear that's been spreading uh, using the national security law. And yes, it's, it's affecting uh, people's behavior. So people are nervous and cautious. And uh, that, that's the effect. And for quite many uh, foreign, foreign nationals, um, for example, uh, if you have joined the Hong Kong protest here, as Australians, and you're outspoken, you became a volunteer or an organizer of a rally in support of Hong Kong's freedoms. At the time, at uh, some point in the future, you travel to Hong Kong, and where you, as you enter the border, you might get trouble entering, you could get expelled, or, and more than that, you, you can be detained. So it's possible uh, with the national security law because it harms the, the state power of the CCP. So that's, that's the effect. But that's also something that we, we have to overcome. And I, I mean, be water. And you need to speak up. But then uh, you need to be wise not to fall into the trap of CCP. And then uh, it in turns losing everyone and having everyone in jail. And so I in, also in that sense, I feel more responsible because I can't go home anyway. My family is all here. I'll go very high profile. So to speak for those who are a bit nervous to speak. And so I, I feel I have a bigger role now. And those Hong Kong diaspora, those in exile, have bigger roles. And I wish those uh, who have less connections uh, with, with Hong Kong, that it wouldn't, not like you have investments, you have family there. Um, uh, please speak up for Hong Kong, so b because Hong Kong people need you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, hello, this is Pei Ji from Transport Workers Union of Australia. And as we discussed, that uh, Hong Kong's press freedom is dying down, but I think Hong Kong still have a strong union movement. So my question is, Ted, do you think Union movement is still a sustainable battleground for pan democracy in Hong Kong to express their ideal, to expand their idea of like democracy and freedom. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I believe so. Thank you for the question. And now, uh, 
politics is not a way to go because we can't participate in uh, open and fair elections. Uh, the half democracy we used to have is gone. So I personally believe in the civil society, uh, in people's power, and I, I, that's my experience of being a parliamentarian uh, in the last four years, and uh, all the freedom movements, uh, what we call the anti-extradition movements, uh, began because the, the Hong Kong regime introduced an extradition bill that Hong Kongers can be extradited back to mainland China for criminal trials. And I, I remember it, uh, it's not us parliamentarians to block the bill from passing. It's the young protesters in the streets and risking their lives and their, their future for Hong Kong. So it's the people's power in the streets in one million people's protest, two million people's protest that really struck the world and showed the world our spirit. So it's all about civil society and it's all about how we uh, affect one person's mind and to spread the message and in turn affecting uh, people's view, changing people's view. And so union is a strong, strong tool and uh, to get all the workers united. And of, of course, it's uh, even more powerful at, at the times when we know that uh, the regime is using economic duress in controlling uh, the grassroots people. So the grassroots people need to be organized and to, be, to stay firm that uh, striking pattern be between uh, having the work right and having the right protected, and but still at the same time knowing what what and where justice is in society. And think about that without without freedom, without the genu genuine freedoms, and can we really speak of labor rights? Right, and uh, I think that's a prerequisite that we need to have freedom first. That's why. Uh, but of course, uh, labor movements and unions, we are totally in line uh, with you, and, and it's important to get them organized. Well, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, do keep an eye on our website for future events and, and research, and uh, I'm sure Ted will stick around for a few minutes if you want to talk, but please join me first in giving him a round of applause for Ted's talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah.